Earth's crammed with heaven, and every common bush a fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. Elizabeth Barrett Browning. This is the Redeemed Imagination Podcast, a podcast of the Anselm Society on reenchanting the church. Welcome back to the Redeemed Imagination Podcast, everyone. I'm Brian Brown with Heidi White, Matt Burnett, and Joel Clarkson today. And we're going to talk about beauty. And we're not just going to talk about beauty. We're going to talk about, on the one hand, does this thing matter? The challenge with beauty that that we typically find is that you can err in one of two directions. You can deal with it as a, uh, if you're into that sort of thing, it's a nice extra, but not particularly central to the work of the gospel or the work of the church. Uh, And the other is that uh, you can err on the side of thinking, well, beauty is dangerous. Beauty can be dangerous if you handle it the wrong way. Anything can be dangerous if you handle it the wrong way. So the challenge, I think, for an artist who is wrestling with how does my craft connect with the larger mission of the church, the challenge for the pastor thinking about, all right, well, my church has no adornment whatsoever. How would I start to chip away at that in a way that is uh, healthy? is how do we do this right? What is the role of beauty in the context of all things Christian? And to kick us off with this conversation, I'm going to tee up Joel because Joel is actually working on a book on uh, beauty and Christianity. So let's make this more personal. You have a background as a film score composer. You've, you've, uh, worked with sacred music fairly extensively. The writing that you do now is is partly coming from your theological training and interest and background, but it's also coming from your perspective as a practicing artist. Uh, and I know recently uh, we, we talked on the Believe to See podcast about uh, a Coral Even song that you wrote not too long ago. Uh, as you were approaching that piece of music, as you were, as you sat down and, and, and thought, I want to write a piece of beautiful music Mm -hmm. that is going to move someone aesthetically, Mm -hmm. but I'm going to write it intentionally for uh, a liturgical context, a spiritual context where the Mm -hmm. goal isn't for them to simply uh, say, oh, that was so pretty, but actually to be drawn closer to God or closer to uh, the, the purpose of that particular portion of the liturgy. Mm. How did you, how did you approach that? How there, there's this dynamic where you are in that moment, you're entering into the very, uh, an incarnation of the larger issue you're talking about here. You're dealing with beauty and truth simultaneously. What's that like? How did you approach that? That's a great question. Um, the incarnation is a statement that God loves what he's created and that he intends it to be part of his redemptive plan. Then when it comes to the arts, I recognize them as participating in that redemptive aspect. And so when it comes to to church music uh, or any kind of music, I mean, I I think in some ways it's interesting to look at liturgy and the way music functions in liturgy and compare that to film. Because in both instances, and I found this when I was writing film music as much as when I was writing liturgical music, they both play this role of taking the encounter we've had with something meaningful and something uh, transcendent in the world itself. And, and they, they hone it, they specify and bring um, specificity to the thing that we are doing. So in, a, in the context of a film, music actually sort of directs that past experience into a specific narrative encounter that we have in the film itself to help us understand what the film is trying to sort of communicate. And the same thing, in a sense, is happening in liturgy. I think music plays not just a sort of incident incidental role that that sort of engages with our emotions. It certainly does that. I mean, we can all speak to moments when we've listened to music and our emotions are, are roused within us. But music is actually helping to transform something that we have encountered in the world itself and then give it specificity because in the liturgy of the historical church over, you know, it's looked different with different traditions. 
But at the end of the day, the liturgy is to reveal one thing to us, and that is the person of Christ. It's to reveal Christ to us and for us to encounter and take him into our hearts and live that out into the world. So music plays this interesting role. James McMillan, who's a, uh, he's a Scottish composer, he talks about music as being the most spiritual of all the arts. And part of the way he talks about that is he says he gets into the crevices and sort of hidden places of the human experience. And I, I find that interesting because when I think of music, I think of how I perceive music and what it sort of and what it actually is itself. So I, I can hear it with my ears. I have this. I'm receiving it through my senses. I'm able to hear it, and then I, when I sing music, I'm able to bring it up out of my my own body and feel it resonating. And so there's all these sensory aspects involved with music. But music can't be seen. Music is something which, like the life of the spirit that we participate in in the Christian life. It is something which is beyond our full grasp in a sense. And so it actually, in a strange way, plays that middle ground well between our embodied selves and the spiritual world that we're participating in. And, and I think in that sense, when it comes to the liturgy, when I come to create, I bear in mind that that's what's happening, that, that when I write music, it, it's possible that it might be used uh, or might be sort of engaged with to help people encounter, uh, come into a relationship. Uh, and I think especially, uh, you know, the, the liturgy that I wrote that particular piece for is a liturgy that focuses on, it, it's a Eucharistic liturgy and uh, it's not the Eucharistic liturgy, but it, it, it has a sort of Eucharistic focus. And so there is this very strong sense of that, that there's always this movement toward Christ. That's that just like in a film with a narrative, liturgy has a narrative. The narrative is the story of redemption that has its climax in the coming of Christ and the revelation of Christ. And so music plays this incredible role in sort of mediating that. And of course, music's not the only art form that does that in a liturgical setting. There, there are other art forms uh, in a multi, uh, you know, a plenitude of, of art forms, but music has a, an interesting role in that sense. And it's, I think in some ways music helps us to get a, a vision for how beauty helps us to engage with God's presence. Okay. But, but that's, that, that was that was extra, right? All the, all the work that you put into those pieces of music, that's a nice bonus. But thinking about uh, music or, 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 or dragging it along to um, a non, non-sacred art setting like poetry or uh, visual art, I mean, it's, it's nice. Oh, man. But all is of it... our hackles are rising, even though we know you're on our side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so to address that, that is a common question mark within for people of faith, right? We know the importance of goodness. We know the importance of truth. But a lot of there needs to be in our generation, sadly enough, an apologetic for beauty. And I think some of that comes from uh, a misuse of beauty in the past um, for not just in 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 the church, in fact, not primarily in the church, uh, but with a misunderstanding of what beauty actually does. Okay. So, and what I mean by that is I'm thinking back, you know, my field's education, so I'm always thinking about um, where things come from, where they, where they're oriented in the historical narrative. And I would say a lot of that comes from, say, the Romantics. And I'm talking about the capital R Romantics, the Romantic poets, Romantic painters, um, all the way up to somebody like Oscar Wilde, who, who talked about art for art's sake in the 20, early 20th century. Um, that is a very great misunderstanding of beauty that permeated into culture, that beauty is an end in itself. What the church, I think, can correct that and say that beauty isn't an end in itself. It is, in fact, a means to God because God is beautiful. God is a creator. He made a beautiful world. And so, therefore, any kind of true beauty is going to point past itself to something beyond itself, to something better, to, in fact, God. And that is what beauty does the action of beauty. Dante says in, um, I think it is purgatory somewhere in the divine comedy. He says, beauty awakens the soul to act. There is an action of beauty and it is not to just wallow in itself, but to point beyond it to the heart of the beautiful creator. Heidi, uh, we have the Bible. 
we have the Holy Spirit. Does anybody really think about the beauty of the Bible, though? Because here's my, this is a big soapbox for me, and I am going to contain this. Um, so, but who, who amongst the church knows about the beauty of, say, the parallelism in biblical poetry, the different narrative structures of parables versus the Old Testament historical narratives, the metaphors, the symbolism that's carried through with something like fire or wine or light and darkness. The Bible is the greatest masterpiece in the history of the world. It is incredibly beautiful, but we don't talk about that because we don't necessarily have an apologetic for it or even knowledge for it. So again, the Bible is not just good and true. And I don't say that to minimize goodness and truth, but it is also beautiful. Goodness, truth, and beauty are the three transcendentals that we embrace in our pilgrimage to the kingdom of God. And so uh, I think a lot of Christians uh, can be more intentional about cultivating beauty, again, not as an end in itself, but as a means to God, the same way goodness and truth are. I actually, I think you're making a really excellent point, Heidi. Even on a very generic level, scripture speaks to beauty. It The, the Psalms speak to the glory of creation. Yes. Concrete images everywhere. Yeah. It's, it's Psalm 96, um, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. You know, there's this, mm-hmm. this notion that holiness, this sort of this action of the spiritual motion is in of itself something to be done in a beautiful way and sort of a, through the means of beauty. And I think I would want to push even further than saying that beauty is merely something which when rightly oriented reveals God to us. I want to sort of align with, with a medieval mindset and say that, Christ and and entering in into his presence someday and this is, this is what we all hope for that's what they would have called the beatific vision they would have said it is yes. it is beauty itself so in a sense when we talk about trying to understand beauty we're not talking about trying to control it or direct it so that we have the right amount of it when beauty is directed uh, correctly it directs us into toward god in whom there is is an infinitude of beauty. And that is the kind of beauty we want. So the question isn't the amount of beauty or the, whether beauty in of itself ought to be controlled. The question is how, how we direct beauty, if that makes sense. Right. Well, and you're talking, you're, you're in, both of us are in, yeah. in phrasing C.S. Lewis, right? In the weight of sure. glory. And yeah. A lot of us, and for those who have read that, there's this lovely passage about um, the beauty of nature drawing the soul beyond it, the limits of the soul into the heart of God is really what he's saying. And he calls it the inconsolable secret. And to make that very concrete, most of us can recognize that as a feeling that we have, right? All of us have experienced the walk in nature or the staring Mm. up into the nave of a great Mm. cathedral or reading a beautiful poem or hearing sacred music or that, that sense that we have in our soul that it's, that it can't contain it. It's going beyond itself, that longing to go past its limits that Mm. is awakened. I would argue almost entirely by beauty in some way that nourishes the soul and invites it to go beyond itself. That's the, Lewis called it the inconsolable secret. I love that little phrase that thing that you can't describe, that feeling that you can't name, but it means something more than yourself. And that is all uh, that usually, and I, I can't be make a blanket statement about this, but I've never known anybody who's had that about a theological proposition, which nourishes the soul in a different way. You're, you're right. It's it that sort of beauty. Yeah, it's the Bonaventurian, great Franciscan Bonaventure, who talks in The Soul's Journey to God, his great work, The Soul's Journey to God. He talks about how there is this intellectual process, which is necessary for coming to understand uh, something truthful about who God is. But ultimately, the intellect holds God at a distance. It holds its object at a distance because it has to sort of understand it, to control it. It has to hold it at a distance. And he says that to draw close, we have to move sort of into this affective engagement, into this passionate engagement that draws the object of our attentions close. And this is where beauty plays an an enormous role. You know, this is, this is part of the the long history of the church in that sense. Mm -hmm. Well, this is where you get, you know, there, there, there's such an interesting story and a rather long one behind why the Anselm Society is named after St. Anselm, not 
some of the reasons are frankly almost incidental uh, and accidental. But but in in retrospect, one of the reasons that he is an improbable but inspirational uh, namesake for an imagination focused organization is that even in his more uh, quote unquote dry uh, apologetics works, he writes theology in a way that is beautiful and that is engaged with beauty because he is coming out of the medieval uh, tradition and the medieval understanding of of theology. He doesn't mm. simply view, he marries all of these things. He doesn't even view theology as propositions. He makes propositions. He, he will argue with you all day long and have a, a rational debate with you all day long. But when he writes about God, he is simultaneously writing He's writing love poetry, but yeah. he's writing love poetry that deals with knowledge in the same way that writing love poetry about uh, someone you've been married to for 30 years is different from writing love poetry about someone that you just met. Uh, mm. when, you've, when, when you've known them for 30 years, who they are, things about their character, things about their nature uh, are going to spill into the love poetry, but it is love poetry nonetheless. It's funny, I, and and on that sort of same uh, note, I think of Aquinas, of course, who, I think the great story is, and I probably will get this mildly wrong, so correct me for those of you who know it, but Aquinas, who wrote the Summa Theologica, which is a massive work of theological propositions, which has been sort of a reference point right in the center of history of Christianity thus far. And it's, it's helped a lot of people sort of understand systematic doctrine in an incredible way. He's, he's one of the great theologians of all time, right before the Renaissance. But, um, but he he a couple centuries before, but he, he has, there's a story of his life uh, that at the end of his life, after writing this massive theological tome, that he has an encounter, he has a vision with Christ. And Christ says, you, I, you have represented me well. He praises Aquinas. And then he shows him, he gives him a glimpse of the beatific vision. And after this vision, Thomas Aquinas says, I uh, nothing, uh, everything I did was straw. There, uh, it was just, it was mere straw. And there's almost this sense in which he moved beyond what he had been able to grasp. You know, we use the intellect to understand as much as we can, but we're talking about an infinite God. We're talking about something beyond our imagination and encountering that God requires more than what we're able to use with our own rational capacities. Mm-hmm. So let's say we lean into this, though, putting this in, in, in practical terms. We are approaching beauty in a way that is uh, focused on tapping into the greater beauty, pointing to the greater beauty. There are, I would say, probably the vast majority of churches, certainly the vast majority of, of new church buildings um, in America are, are deeply suspicious of not necessarily beauty, but beauty past a certain point, perhaps. Right. Um, the Puritans take all kinds of flack uh, for wearing black and not like not enjoying fun, which they did not deserve. But they did tend to build church buildings, which while beautiful on some level, were very, very simple. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a suspicion of adornment in that particular context at any rate. And Calvin writing about visual art is writes in a way that is very dismissive and deeply scornful of people who view art as valuable for anything other than uh, essentially communicating information. If it's not there to communicate information within a certain subset, it's not relevant to the work of the church. Yeah. So in this in this kind of context, we're we're not we're not talking about this in a vacuum. We're not talking about this um, where we're 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 all sitting around uh, in some sort of John Locke context, figuring out what sort of society we want to have, what sort of church polity <laughs> we want to have, what sort of buildings we want to have. Uh, we're dealing with a real. Sounds exhausting. <laughs> we're, 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 ta- we're talking about a real, right. a real life context where plain is more common than adorned, where stories used perhaps to make a point in a sermon, but not all that much the rest of the time uh, in a church context, where uh, visual art, uh, no one quite seems to know what to do with in a church context. We'll all go to the National Gallery of Art when we're in D.C. and we will all enjoy it and we will all find 
value in the art there, but we won't necessarily, it's not going to necessarily be a part of our day-to-day lives. If this is normal to a large extent for a majority of us, what do we do with that? What, is it, what does it mean to start approaching beauty from a practical standpoint in a way that's, that doesn't simply divide the world into nerds and everybody else? Right. Ah, if you've got the time, you can go get your MFA. Right. That's culture. That's different from the spiritual life, right? I'm curious what Father Matt thinks about that. I'm really interested in taking this from the realm of the theoretical into the practical. And we have a practitioner amongst us within the church. So I'm Father Matt, will you talk about um, how to make beauty, how to translate beauty into action in a worshiping community? How do you do that um, in your church? And you know, maybe by extension, then how can those of us who are lay people bring some of that sacred beauty into our own lives? Mm, that's a great question. Um, let me start broad and then start, again, kind of come down to Holy Trinity. When you drive around, you see a variety of architecture, don't you? Uh, some mm-hmm. of it, uh, say you go to the churches downtown and they're older churches um, from a different aesthetic with, frankly, a different budget. <laughs> over the years, no, I mean, this is important, um, and they're and they're kind of classically beautiful. They're grand and extraordinary, and and, and wonderfully endowed with with lots of beauty. Every once in a while, then you see um, a church, a re- more recent building, where the the pastor and I'm gonna I'm gonna think of my friends and how they would express this. We're trying to create a place for people who want to gather um, and worship God on very limited budgets, for example. Right, and so they build something that's that's pretty much utilitarian, and so it's 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 pretty ugly, right? It's pretty ugly, and the, even they would say as much, but they would consider it a fair trade in order to be able to have a space at all. Fair enough. Um, so then we come to Holy Trinity, which is a, a renovated restaurant, but it really has a lot of beauty to it. It has this sort of Tuscan stucco wonderful tile. So it's sort of this in-between space, actually, that we've converted. And in our sanctuary, per se, you've got a fairly simple setup. It's um, almost all chairs, but they're the kind of the dark oak with the red covers and you know, windows with dark kind of wood framing around it. We have a carved Lord's table at the front. We've got some some banners kind of to the, to the side. So how do we navigate that locally? Uh, part of it is that practical piece. This is what we've inherited and what we could afford. Part of it then is is trying to then also live into our heritage, which has which is sort of the big downtown churches. Part of it is that there is, Brian, you mentioned this, a real beauty and simplicity um, as well. And so to keep our windows with the clear light coming through and the view to the mountains and that kind of thing, has a, a beauty of its own that I think is really significant. Um, at the same time, during certain different seasons of the year, we might adorn it with different um, uh, different vestments that we wear, uh, slight um, adornments on the Lord's table. We would adorn it with different language. So we, we're now we're getting to the liturgy, where we use the liturgy in different ways. And I think the beauty shows up in the language of the liturgy. Um, I think it shows up... And some explicit, it may feel a little artificial, but I think it can work in explicit efforts to weave in. So say this Lent, we're going to be weaving in uh, artists' comments on the collect of the day. That is the prayer of the day in our in our nomenclature. We have these prayers of the day that, are, that encapsulate what's happening that day. But we've also asked artists then to reflect on them. And those are going to be woven into the liturgy. Not all of them, but some of them. Sometimes then we also use visual uh, projections. Well, I think it's one way to use our um, use our screens well, is to project things, uh, beautiful things. I'm not sure if I'm getting to your question, Heidi, but um, but it is a consideration. I will say that adornments add beauty, but like any adornment, they can also add distraction. And so, where's the balance? 
I, I saw a picture, and I'll end with this, and then I'll, I'll shut up. Um, there was a recent picture, this gorgeous picture uh, that I saw, oddly enough, on Facebook um, <laughs> of, a, of an Orthodox priest uh, kneeling in, in the sanctuary. And, of course, every square inch was covered with paintings and, and, um, and icons and had the beautiful chandelier above and, and everything. And it, was, and it was stunning, right? It was beautiful, sort of an all-encompassing uh, picture. And but then I thought to myself also, leaning myself probably more towards the augmented simplicity, I could also paint you a picture of a high vaulted ceiling with mostly white walls, but these big um, wooden beams, a beautiful Lord's table at the front with a three tiered pulpit um, and the light streaming in through these clear windows in its, in its wonderful sort of filtered way upon um, a more Puritan pastor kneeling just like the Orthodox was. And I could also generate a photo of transcendence and grandeur and beauty. Uh, I would suggest of equal um, beauty, but of very different types. I remember our friend John Skillen at Gordon College made the observation uh, that the type of adornment that you want to put in your church will affect the type of art forms you evolve for it. If the type of adornment is merely adornment, merely decorative, that's going to uh, be friendlier to certain art forms than to others. If artists are creating works for the church that are as much about expressing themselves or uh, something that is artist-focused, they're going to create certain forms of art. By contrast, uh, the example that I remember him using was frescoes. The, the only way that some, an art form like a fresco would come to exist is if you expected the wall that it was going to be put on to be there for a thousand years, to form a community for a thousand years. Because it is the wall. It's not on the wall. It is the wall. Exactly. And, and that's a weird, weird concept mm -hmm. in an American context. Right. That's, it's, it's not that we don't think it's beautiful when we hear it. It's that there's, there's really no parallel. I don't know what to right. do with that. One of the things to, again, keep it um, specific and practical is that, again, I, I go to Holy Trinity, so I'm part of these conversations as well. Any conversation that we have about beauty happens in the context of truth. It does not happen as decoration to truth. Right. It does not happen as simply an additional extra way to communicate truth. Right. Mm -hmm. The conversation about what art we might want to commission or invite, what artists we might want to involve in a given liturgical season or for a particular purpose always starts with uh, what is the encounter that we want people to have with the truth. Mm -hmm. How can the art facilitate that so that it happens in ways it wouldn't happen without the art? Mm -hmm. And we are we have not yet commissioned a fresco in our former restaurant building. <laughs> but when you take Edmund back to the uh, nursery, though, what do you see? Murals. Things on the from walls. From beginning to end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're starting uh, in the context that we have with some similar uh, mindsets. And... We encourage artists to start creating things in a church context. And again, this is one context. This mm -hmm. is We're talking about beauty broadly. We're not just talking about church art. But in the context of church art, since that's where we've landed at the moment, uh, we, we are approaching it in terms of what does this add to someone's ability to encounter the truth? Right. Well, in the church is and should provide the model for the secular kingdom. Right. That's what we 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 go to church and we carry that and we and we build that in our own little churches, uh, which is a, a phrase from the Orthodox Church that's supposed to go to every home is a little church. So you have morning prayers and icons and incense and candles the same way in a little church as you do in, in the great church. And all church, all historic church traditions take that as their primary model and one of the purposes, not the only purpose, but one of the purposes of going to church is, as everybody has talked about, spiritual formation that you take then into your life and the other days of the week. So I think that 
what Joel mentioned earlier and what Father Matt alluded to, the idea of the beauty of the liturgy is so profound that there is absolutely no disentangling goodness, truth, and beauty and making them distinct in the liturgy of the church. They are all of a piece. The liturgy is good. It is true. And it is beautiful. And that is that unity of those three streams that nourish the individual soul and the soul of the church and the life of the world is that is what we as Christians in our daily life and in our sacred attendance of church are, are trying to imitate and put into practice. I want to let let, uh, Joel back in. On, on that note, because that starts to get at something very, very, I, I think that's what pushes us over from yes. beauty is helpful to beauty is essential. Yes, not an adornment, as you said. When it just is the truth and it is the goodness. And all of those things are beautiful. If you are dealing with, we could have a longer conversation about the purpose of church, the the purpose of liturgy. I was, I was skimming through, you use the phrase for the life of the world. I was yes. skimming through uh, Alexander Schmemann's book by that name in preparation for today's conversation. And, and I was, and sadly, every time he communicated something that would have teed up the conversation really well, he, he communicated it in two or three pages. So yeah. we couldn't use it as our opening quote, but so well, he, he, he starts to chip away at, at modern sort of Americanized understandings of what worship is and what church is. Um, not in an incredibly foreign, this makes no sense to me sort of way, but in a way that almost any Protestant Catholic or Orthodox reader could, could read and go, yeah, that's what we're trying to do here. Talks about church, talks about worship, talks about spiritual formation in such a way that you're getting, it's not a prayer break. Right. Um, it's not just uh, a glorified lecture with some music beforehand. Or a place to meet friends. It's, or a place to meet friends. Yeah. Or a community. It's not any, it has some of the, all of these elements to it, but we are here to be to encounter something right. that is not us and to be made into something that we are not yet. Amen. 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 And in that, if that's the case, if we are looking to encounter that, then I think what we're suggesting is goodness, truth, and beauty together are the only way. If you try to get mm-hmm. there with just goodness and truth, what you end up with is... Um, Moralism. Sorry? Moralism. Right. Yeah excellent facts and perhaps good behavior. Well, and bereft. And I think what it's important to say that many Christians do that. And if we're talking about formation, there is such a thing as being deformed and malformed as well as being formed. So many Christians can make it through their entire pilgrimage towards the kingdom without encountering the inconsolable secret. And that's like my passion in life is go, go encounter that. It matters. Don't be malformed. Pursue that. Seek it. There's a great tradition in, in a contemporary sense and a historical sense of, of great geniuses and people who have attempted to channel that for the ordinary person. And that is worth exploring. So thank you to Joel, who does that on a daily basis. That's his vocation. And thank you to all of us who are trying to do that. Well, and, and what we're really starting to get up against uh, at, at this point is, well, well, now we're after this encounter. We're after this, not, not, not just this learning experience, but something that transforms us, which I think brings us right up against a very concrete follow-up question, which is then... What is the role of beauty, of the imagination, of indirect education, or at any rate, um, forms of teaching that are not person A speaking or writing to person B in order to convey information? Mm-hmm. What, is, what is the role of all of that relative to the role of person A speaking or writing to person B in the form of a sermon or a theological work or something? And that is what we will talk about next time. In the meantime, um, since we started off with Joel and since we've been talking over him for the last several minutes, I'll give him the, the last word. Joel, any last thoughts on this? Yeah. So, you know, I loved some of what's been said because uh, there's this question about, you know, truth, goodness, beauty, the interplay between the three, how they play into our worship. And 
Uh, Dietrich von Hildebrand, who was a Catholic theologian in mid 20th century, uh, very in, in important to a lot of what happened in Vatican II, he uh, says, along with other theologians of his time, and some uh, currently like like um, Joseph Ratzinger, who would go on to become Benedict the Sixteenth, he talks about how ultimately the purpose of worship, the purpose of liturgy, of the formal liturgy, is to offer the right worship to God. It is to adore God and to love him and to show our proper worship to him. And we have this problem because we in of ourselves don't have the means to do that. Our worship is imperfect, you know, and in the sense that we, we have this distance, we see the truth, we see what we, what we ought, but, but there's this distance and Christ is the bridging of that distance between the worship we ought to give and the worship which we are unable to give. And as the embodiment, as the, as the final point, as the telos or the end point of beauty, when we come into worship, the elements of beauty, the, the, the beautiful elements that we engage with music and the visual that we see, all of these are means of helping us to partner not just our intellects, but our affective desires and our intentions with the person of Christ, aiming and realigning and refocusing our worship on God. So the beautiful draws us closer to the truth, the truth which is Christ embodied. Christ is the truth. Christ is the word. He's the incarnate word. And beauty brings us, it helps to span the distance in Christ. All right, everyone, thanks for joining us on the Redeemed Imagination podcast. We will talk to you next time. 